Well, welcome, Tim. I am super excited to have you on Flora Funga podcast today. I saw you at the, it was the foraging meeting, where was it, near Stillwater, where I met you, and I just thought you were pretty interesting, and um, I'd love to know more, and you're also the president of the Minnesota Mycological Society, which I'm also a part of, so can you give a little bit of intro about you and how you got into flora and funga? Sure, yeah, my name is Tim Clemens. Um, I am a professional forager and foraging instructor in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, yeah, I mean, I got into foraging. Um, in college mm -hmm. as an actual practice. Uh, but I started foraging when I was a little kid. My identical twin and I used to go into people's gardens and <laughs> eat all the yummy food mm -hmm. and uh, climb in their trees and eat their fruit that we could reach. Uh, oh, but then cool. I started as a practice um, in college. And here I am uh, a little over a decade later. Uh, and now I teach and okay. uh, yeah. Yeah, what, uh, what kind of education were you interested in then and what have what has changed now yeah so my degree is in anthropology and archaeology Ooh, okay. i thought i would be kind of you know traveling the world um doing excavations doing a lot of museum work uh i didn't do any of that mm -hmm. <laughs> uh you know during my last semester at the university of minnesota i uh you know fell in love with plants um and i just realized wait a minute <laughs> that's what I should do with my life and okay. that's what I've been doing ever since. Nice I like that and so how did you get into leading these foraging groups um, or being a part of the MMS? Yeah. Yeah so you know I, my foraging started with plants mm -hmm. and that's what I fell in love with but then I realized I was seeing mushrooms everywhere and mm -hmm. wherever I was seeing like foraging content online or in books there's always you know a section on mushrooms or so people were talking about mushrooms I realized I didn't know anything about mushrooms mm. so I like originally I took a book that was about as thick as a book can get I think it was over a thousand pages it was some <laughs> North American mycological guide um, and I took it out with my friend we found we tried to identify a red capped russula from just the macroscopic characteristics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anybody who's aware, that's pretty much impossible. Um, and so it was a rough entry, but it did make me realize that, oh, I needed some help. And so I just threw into Google, I just put Minneapolis Mushroom Club, because mm -hmm. I didn't know mycological societies existed even. Right, right. Um, and then what came up was the Minnesota Mycological Society. I had never heard of the word mycological, but that's how I learned that mycology is the study of fungi. And so I just mm -hmm. showed up to my first meeting. It was in September of, I want to say 2014. Okay. And I did not know what I was getting into. <laughs> uh, I just entered this university classroom alone and there was probably around 50 or 60 people in this lecture hall and they seemed nice enough mm -hmm. i didn't know what, what to expect um a mix of ages a mix of you know all kinds of people and so i just mm -hmm. got a seat and then they started talking about mushrooms and it just blew my hair back oh. uh, and so then i decided to join the minnesota mycological society uh oh. and it was a great choice and now i think something around six years after that i became the president okay so the president is a new thing for you technically yeah. okay yep been president for about two years. Okay. And what are, what are your favorite like parts or perks about being a, in a part of a mycological society? Well, I think the best part is you get to network with mm -hmm. other people that are interested in what you're interested in. Um, I think people learn much quicker as a community. Yes. Uh, I know I was doing a lot just on my own, just doing the autodidactic thing, you know, self-teaching. But yep. I started to realize there was a pattern. Like whenever I spent even just one day with a knowledgeable person or multiple people, all of a sudden, like my knowledge, you know, increased drastically. And I was mm -hmm. like, wait a minute, there's a pattern here. I need to, I need to start spending time with people more. And mm -hmm. that's what the Minnesota Mycological Society gave me. It was direct access to experts and very experienced people who yeah. wanted to teach. 
Yeah, that's a good point. I feel like everybody goes, you know, goes to college or reads up on these identification books, but until you actually go out and look at these um, items, either plants or mushrooms, then you don't really know what you're getting into. And I think going to that foray with you definitely was like, wow, there is a lot of people here. Everybody's got different knowledge. And then we all could kind of team up and learn from each other. And it definitely stuck in my brain more. So that that is a plus. I like that. That's awesome. mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I know I learn something uh, every time I do a class mm-hmm. or every time I'm around anybody, even if they think they don't know, like even if they're new, mm-hmm. I always learn something. Yeah. And I usually learn it from the people that don't really know things too, which is interesting. So that's cool. They bring different um, perspectives onto me and I like that too. Um, so how, yeah, how would uh, you, how would you recommend somebody to get into a society like this? Well, for the Minnesota Mycological Society, you can just sign up online. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, really just Google is your best friend. Look in your local area. Um, just like throw in keywords because it might not be something as straightforward as like the city you're in mm-hmm. or even necessarily the state you're in. You might want to search the county you're in uh, because it might be named after the county or um, maybe there's like a local cultural thing that the club might be named after for instance I mean in northern Minnesota we have the Paul Bunyan Mushroom Club right yeah and so like maybe you wouldn't think looking that up um, you know if you're not from the area also I think it's a really good idea to start with whatever local university you're near Um, they typically have mycology clubs and they might even be open to you know, non-students. Yeah, that's a good point. Or they could at least give you a lead. Mm-hmm. That is. And good then you advice. could start to them. <laughs> yes, yes, definitely. I would love to do um, a plant walk or mushroom walk too. So that's kind of why I wanted to interview you because I met you while you were doing one of the the forays. So how how do you get into that? How what are some tips and tricks to even lead your own uh, mushroom walk? Yeah, I think, uh, well, first, you definitely want to know what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. You want to, you want to feel comfortable. Yes. Like, you don't just want to, like, you don't want to know, you want, you want to have, like, a comfort with this knowledge, you know, like, if you had to give a presentation about bananas, you know, right. you've eaten bananas, how many thousands of times, it's something that you could talk about, you know, you could talk about recipes, put them in pancakes, whatnot, banana bread. So that's something you're comfortable with. Mm -hmm. Um, You want to make sure that if you're talking about plants or mushrooms or insects for the purpose of eating, at least, you want to be very sure. If you're just doing ID, that maybe is a little bit less pressure. So you can go out and, you know, just give IDs and tell people how to ID stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, The next thing would be, um, it's a good idea when you're first starting out to do it through a third party organization. So maybe not a company that you've started, um, and maybe not as your just yourself. Mm-hmm. You'd want to like team up with maybe uh, a local historical society or a municipal group, maybe a park or mm-hmm. something like that. Um, because in in our world we live in, uh, you know, liability is a concern, and right. so you do want to team up maybe with uh, you know an organization that has liability insurance before you get your own because it can mm. be kind of spendy. Mm, okay. Um, so you need like a form or a certificate or anything before you can technically lead something with a big group or? No, not at no. all. There, okay. there, are no, there are no certifications for teaching about, you know, edible plants or edible fungi. Mm-hmm. Um, there's one certificate for, you know, selling mushrooms commercially, at least in Minnesota, which right. many students also have. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, there's no, there's no degree for this at all you could do a biology degree a biology degree or a botany degree mm-hmm. or a mycology degree but oftentimes these aren't about anything you're going to do in the field really like right there's no field mycology degree <laughs> that's um, true you know mm-hmm. so yeah i mean mm-hmm. you kind of just got to teach yourself right and have you gone with multiple people like teaching at once or is it a lot of the times just you with these people walking yeah it's typically just me Mm -hmm. um, especially through my company or yeah it's always just been me however 
you know, when I do teach at something like the Midwest Wild Harvest Festival, mm -hmm. which is like the premier foraging um, gathering in the country, it's in Wisconsin, it's put on by Foragers Harvest. Um, then everyone's so knowledgeable that attends that it quickly be you quickly like understand that everyone has something like very high level to offer and it becomes a, like a, a dialogue or a group conversation mm -hmm. um, so that was that was really cool that was just a, a couple weeks ago that I did that oh, that's nice. uh, but yeah typically it's just me yeah and what are some of the age groups um, or if people are worried that it's too much of a hike or stuff like that what what kind of age groups or what kind of people can do this with you yeah, I think a, an important part is letting people know what they're in for. Mm -hmm. uh, communication is very important because oftentimes, you know, people are riding a wave of enthusiasm right now for fungi, especially, but also plants. You know, plants maybe seem mundane, um, but people like the enthusiasm to return to these like ancestral ways really takes people over in a tsunami. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they can kind of like, they just wash up on the shore and they're like, I'm just ready to go. Like <laughs> and they maybe don't think about what they need to know. So you got to effectively communicate that. So, you know, here's what the terrain is going to be like. It's maybe if it's going to be challenging or hilly, uh, you want to let people know that, mm -hmm. or if it's going to be even just a paved trail, that's good to let people know too. Um, my classes, I do allow anybody at them. Mm -hmm. So children to um, our elders are, are all welcomed. Um, but I do put on walks that are, you know, maybe more elder focused mm -hmm. and definitely, you know, some wheelchair accessible walks where we are on pavement because yeah. yeah, you can absolutely do things like that. I haven't done any children workshops yet, but that's a very common offering that I know a lot of people do. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's an entry point for everyone. Um, I've also done, um, BIPOC workshops through the St. Paul parks. Oh, what are, what so is that? that is specifically for black indigenous and people of color. Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes, you know, it can feel very intimidating for those communities to get involved in anything to do with nature. Yeah. Um, and so it's really, that's an entry point if someone feels more comfortable doing that. Right. Some like accessibility, like all you need is like some normal walking shoes probably. And that's kind of it. Yeah. I always tell people bring closed toe. Yeah. At, at the minimum, I say closed toed shoes. Mm -hmm. And then long pants that mm -hmm. they can tuck their socks into All right. and bring water. And then if there's any sort of weather considerations, I say, I ask them to plan for their comfort. Mm -hmm. So I'll say sunscreen if you need it, bug spray if you need it, and raincoat if you need it. And yes. then we cancel if there's any severe weather. Mm -hmm. Got it. Yeah, the bugs are crazy if you're just going to be walking through <laughs> stuff. That is um, something that I liked with the walk that I did was that I think there was multiple leaders. And so it was based on the, I guess, the terrain, because I think you were leading the more intense one. And then the other ones were more um, easy paths. And I was like, I'm going for the intense ones. Let's go. Um, so that was good. <laughs> and then I saw dogs there too, which was cool. Yeah. Yeah. Allowing people to self-select their level of challenge is also really important because mm -hmm. you don't want to put anybody in a position where they're, you know, at their limit because they're trying to learn so you want right. them to be comfortable right exactly um and how would you suggest people to network to create some sort of group like this like how could people make their own walk or yeah. community that's a really good question um i have noticed communities popping up uh of people who have attended my classes mm -hmm. um through, through ironwood foraging but also through the minnesota mycological society um you know, you, sometimes you just hit it off with people and there's chemistry uh, mm -hmm. when you're out of class. And I encourage people to follow that. Um, I've even had classes where, you know, three or four people will stay behind and be like, we're actually going to go right back out, you know, <laughs> like <laughs> hang out and go look for mushrooms. Oh, and I'm like, that's awesome. absolutely. You should also go look at this hillside that we didn't look at, you know, like, oh. so, yeah. But if you want to start like a formal group, I would just, you know, find a couple like-minded people, maybe put up flyers at, you know, likely spots, like mm -hmm. um, maybe a co-op or a, maybe a hangout that speaks to you and the people you right. want to associate with. Yeah. yeah. And then um, like, for instance, there is a new mycological society in Minnesota. Mm. It's called the um, 
Lake Superior Mycological Society. Okay. And so actually people from all walks of life in Duluth, Minnesota, just decided they wanted to make a, a mycological society up there because awesome. it's about a three hour drive to Minneapolis where most of the Minnesota mycological society meetings are. So that can be a drive. That can be kind of a drag. Can't really yeah. easily get to our foray locations. So yeah, make something that's near you and people will come. Yeah, no, I like that because up north has so much so much woodsy areas, so much mushroom, so much plants. So that makes sense that people would just want to stick up there. Yeah, do you get up there a lot? Um, not often. I go to Duluth here and there. Um, I have some, my mom actually went to school up there and lived up there. So I know the area, but again, yeah, I'm in Rochester. So it's an extra hour and a half up there. <laughs> but do you know, do you know a Sammy Peterson? No. That sounds oh, familiar. They're, yeah, they're a foraging instructor in okay. Rochester or nearby. Oh, um, okay. And I've seen them on Facebook. I don't know them personally, but okay. um, yeah. I'll have to look that up. Is it like S-A-M-M-Y or? Yeah, S-A-M-M-I-E. Okay. And then Peterson. Peterson. All right, I'll have to look that up. I'll jot that down. That's awesome. Um and you mentioned your your company, Ironwood Foraging. Can you explain how you got into that? And yeah, what is that about? I mean, sure. Um, I, you know, in these capitalistic days, uh, <laughs> I, being a millennial, I have to monetize my hobbies if I want to survive capitalism. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, in around 2017, um, I already kind of had an inkling that I, wanted to figure out some sort of um, job or career that I could do using foraging because I realized I love being outside. Mm -hmm. I love what I'm doing. And, you know, sure, I would be able, I would love to be able to do what I love um, without money concerns, but that's not my real life. Yeah. So I, I was like, okay, sweet. I'll make a company. Now, what do I do at that company? <laughs> Initially, I thought I started Ironwood Foraging to, you know, go out and mushroom hunt or go out and harvest um, plants mm -hmm. and to sell to restaurants. That was kind of my like intro. I was like, mm -hmm. that's what I'll do. And then I realized I could also teach and teaching not only made, so teaching made me feel better mm -hmm. for one. Cause when I was out harvesting commercially, I, I didn't necessarily feel good about it. Yeah. Um, there's there's definitely ways to do it in a really good way. And uh, I do that now partially with a, a restaurant and a group um, called Owamni okay. uh, with the sous chef in the indigenous kitchen. But um, back then, I, you know, I wasn't really comfortable. So I was like, okay, I'm going to start teaching. And that's when I back a bit. started teaching full time. Um, it was actually the first year of the pandemic in 2020. Oh, wow. Yeah, it worked out perfect. Good. Yeah. So how, how did COVID affect you and your business then? Or just like seeing people out and about? Well, it actually gave me a ton of business because everyone was trying to figure out how to get out of the house, how to not <laughs> congregate inside. Like, because everything, you know, suddenly everything people did, they couldn't do anymore. You couldn't mm -hmm. go to the movie theater to waste three hours. You couldn't go to the a brewery and hang out with your friends for a few hours you you had to like be outside and mm -hmm. people didn't know how to do outside That's and so true. the star tribune um did an article about me that really like came out at the perfect time mm -hmm. and so people were like wait you can wait there are plants outside and <laughs> mushrooms outside that you can yes. eat yes and this one kind of teach us how and so yeah that that was perfect and it was great for me too because I mean, the hobby of foraging and the practice of foraging gets you outside and mm -hmm. I didn't skip a beat. Like that is essentially what I do with my life. So yeah. I was able to hang out with friends still. I was like, hey, you want to go for a walk? And then we got to talk about plants on the way. So I I, love that. I think I was in my element. <laughs> yeah, I like that. What are some of the classes and workshops that you teach or what are some of the things that you want to do in the future? Yeah, so right now, I do a beginner mushroom hunting class, which was kind of rough this year because we were in extreme drought in most of the states. 
Mm. Um, so the mushrooms were hesitant to come out. Um, but in a typical year, I'll have several classes from spring uh, through fall. But this okay. year, I didn't really have any. Um, and then I'll also do a foraging workshop. So that's there's two kinds. The, one is an urban foraging workshop. And mm -hmm. the other one is just like a, a seasonal foraging workshop. The urban one, we go into an urban area, typically Minneapolis or St. Paul. And I show people that um, this is actually a landscape of abundance. Nature is all around you at all times. And mm -hmm. it's a philosophy mixed with, um, you know, foraging. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's, it's very healing to the urban resident to, to learn that. But it's also healing to anybody who maybe visits a city and thinks, wow, this is very di different from, you know, my suburban or rural life. Yep. Um, it's it's actually okay to look at a city as like a part of nature, mm -hmm. you know, and you don't have to feel so beset yes. um, by all the concrete. But then the other, the seasonal foraging workshop, that's less, it's a little bit of philosophy, but it's more like, I would say a mix of forest bathing. Mm -hmm. And then also you're able to try a lot of new flavors of yeah. berries, fruits, uh, maybe nuts, definitely lots of leaves and spices. Um, and we get a good hike in too. So I try to make those a little under three miles so that okay. we're moving, getting the blood flowing. I like that. People leave their commutes behind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. And, and what are your favorite like things to forage for in urban and rural uh, areas? Yeah. So in urban areas, I mm -hmm. would say I'm all up in your landscaping. Like if you're a, like, ecologically conscious dentist yes. and you have an office and your parking lot is lined with service berry trees oh. or aronia berries I'm all up in that um, <laughs> look out thank, thank you thank you <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I also love urban areas because it's an area of disturbance mm. and so that means a lot of what we call weedy species are present mm -hmm. and oftentimes those weeds are edible and totally delicious and nutritious mm -hmm. and they're super easy to find because they're everywhere and so <laughs> it makes urban foraging I mean really easy it couldn't be easier that's true and then um, in my in the rural areas I would say I get a lot more native species that don't compete so well in disturbance mm -hmm. um, so I get more wild plums oh, um, yeah. ramps which is a wild onion mm -hmm. um, I get more mushrooms too. So, you know, your chanterelles, your hen of the woods, you know, that rely, you know, the chanterelles rely on a symbiotic relationship with oak trees. So mm -hmm. you don't have that much stability in the urban area to get chanterelles. So yeah, you kind of have to go out a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah that's find, like some of them. Yeah. Yeah, you don't find much mushrooms, I guess, in like cities as much just because trees aren't as prevalent. So that, I guess, makes sense. Yeah, what do you what do you like to look for? Um I I'm right now mostly just about the hikes. Um I do like chanterelles as well. Um I love matsutake <laughs> if I can ever find those. Um but yeah, I, I like get mostly just like to wander around and travel and that's that's where I'm at right now. Have you ever made your way to like Grand Teton or out in Wyoming or Colorado? No, I, I've been to Colorado, but I want to go to Wyoming. Um, what's what's there that you recommend? Just one. Well, you around. bring up Matsutake. Oh, yes. And uh, I found my first ever Matsutake in Grand Teton. Mm. And that was this year. And so good. I literally am walking the trail and there's hundreds of, I mean, hundreds when I'm there. So hundreds of oh. thousands of tourists every year walking this trail and I look to the to my side of the trail and there's there's a mushroom uh -huh. on either side of the trail and I'm like no way <laughs> I, I just hopped down on this yep. like face on the ground looking at it smelled like whoa <laughs> and I smelled it and it just smelled of cinnamon mm -hmm. in a little funk oh, and yeah. I was like this is unreal I can't believe this can't be it and so like I gently pry it out of the ground <laughs> and I'm looking at all the ID features. Oh my gosh. And I'm like, oh my God, I found my first Matsutake. That's awesome. That's <laughs> and amazing. I found more. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I guess I also like um, Maitake and um, uh, 
Lines, Maine, but I don't find those often where I'm at, but my parents live near Coon Rapids area, so they always have a neighbor that brings over a huge chunk, and my mom sends me pictures, and she's like, oh, the neighbors finally brought some more mushrooms over, and so I get to see the pictures and some of the leftovers that she has. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yeah, so that's really nice. Random question, uh, what made you name your company Ironwood Foraging? Yeah, so I was agonizing over a name for quite mm -hmm. some time. I wanted it to, so, so first of all, I wanted it to sound cool, but also <laughs> like like cool in a naturey way. And I just okay. could not, I could not figure out what to name it. I had all these ideas crossed out, whole pages of ideas. Like, <laughs> no, it's stupid. Like, um, I was having a straight up existential crisis mm. about this naming thing. Okay. And then I was in the Eloise Butler Wildflower Garden in Theodore Worth Park in okay. Minneapolis and that's a happy place for me I love going there mm -hmm. everyone should go there uh but be respectful um don't all descend upon it at once but there, what's really cool about that place is it's just phenomenally curated and there are signs mm -hmm. telling you like what you're looking at I like that so that can help you ID right mm -hmm. and then the back the, the so in the very back of the garden is this massive ironwood tree. Oh. And I didn't know it was an ironwood tree the first time we met because I just saw this huge tree and I, I touched it. it. It had different bark than I was used to. Mm -hmm. And I touched it and I just felt the sense of like strength. Ooh. Like, you know, something bigger, older, and just like timeless. And that's when I was like, why don't I name it ironwood foraging? And that's why I did it. I but like now that. everybody thinks I'm from Michigan because apparently there's an Ironwood, Michigan. Oh, <laughs> so okay. Like, hey, do you do question? Do you do uh, um, workshops near Ann Arbor? And I'm like, no, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's the tree, not the place. <laughs> exactly, it's a specific tree too. Yes. Wow. Well, I'm glad I asked because I was like, hmm, I wonder what the story is there. But yeah. awesome. Do you have a pl a favorite plant or mushroom fact? Ooh. Uh, you know what? I have so many and they're trying to get all good through the mental door um, at the same time. <laughs> I would say uh, a lot of people don't know that humans and fungi mm -hmm. are, we're the closest, like animalia and fungi, the kingdoms are mm -hmm. the closest related organisms um, to the exclusion of all other life. We make a little group, just the, the two of our kingdoms. And I can never remember how to pronounce the actual group but it's like something like a cyclodonts or a okay cyclodonts. i yeah i can't remember all right um but i thought that was really cool and then i saw like similarities between fungi and animals that i didn't really see before mm -hmm. like the fact that our stomachs kind of behave the same Ooh. like you know medically speaking that tube that runs from your mouth all the way to the other end mm -hmm. is outside of your body. And so your immune system faces in to protect you from it. Right. And then we put food in there to excrete enzymes to digest it. Well, fungi also excrete enzymes outside of their bodies to then absorb nutrition. And I mm -hmm. thought that was a really cool, like synapomorphy almost, or similarity, um, yeah. you know, between our two kingdoms. And you know, synapomorphies, when you're talking about plants, for instance, like, you know, all mints have a square stem and opposite leaves, or yes. all mustards have a four petaled flower with six stamens and four are long and two are short. And that's mm -hmm. a mustard plant anywhere. Um, yeah, those, those higher level relationships at kingdom level, it's like a little bit harder to see, but, you know, something like our stomachs and our enzymes, um, that's, that's a synapomorphy between two kingdoms and mm. that's fungi and animalia. That's cool. And I kind of like that word. <laughs> awesome. Um, I was looking at your website and you had a blog about Japanese beetles. And we also talked about this um, when I was when I met you. Can you give the listeners a little bit about what they can do with their Japanese beetles? Because that was really interesting to learn. <laughs> yeah, what you can do with the Japanese beetles that are terrorizing your garden. Um, <laughs> You know, they eat over 450 plants that we also eat. Mm -hmm. So they're direct competition. Um, and so, yeah, you basically, you want to eat them, 
you want to gather them. So I would suggest a trap that you empty several times a day. Mm -hmm. uh, but you can also go out with a like a quart jar with a little water in the bottom and you know flick them in there and they hold each other down like crabs in a bucket so you don't have to worry about like them flying away or flying on you or at you because that can be a little jolting for people mm -hmm. um but yeah you just uh i like to refrigerate or freeze them um because then that puts them in a dormant state and then I boil them for about five minutes. Mm -hmm. and then they're safe to eat. Uh, at that point, you know, they kind of don't taste like anything. If you smell the water, you might smell like something like a kind of earthy flavor that people <clears throat> people might not like when it's mm -hmm. associated with insects. So um, I like to marinate them in something, whatever you want them to taste like. So I've candied them, which is really nice. Uh, but I've also done like a tequila lime recipe, which is the one on my website. And then like a Thai chili or a Cajun garlic. What, oh, that sounds what good. Has. Like popcorn. Yeah, exactly. Like popcorn. And they're just a light, crispy crunch that you can barely even uh, recognize when you eat them. It's mm. just very flavorful. No gush. And so what kind of trap would you recommend if people wanted to leave it out? Yeah, there's a, like, you can go to any, like, home improvement store. Mm -hmm. um, around here, we have Fleet Farm, Home Depot, Menards, Lowe's. Um, yeah, they also have a Japanese beetle pheromone trap. It has the, it's typically a bag, mm -hmm. and you just leave that out. Now, a lot of people leave it out because they're not trying to eat these, so they leave it out, like, for days and days, and the sun gets to it, and yeah. then, of course, it starts smelling, and then people are like, I could never imagine eating those. Well, yeah. you don't leave your cheeseburger outside for days <laughs> um, either, so you want to you wanna empty it, I'd say, more than five times a day, Okay. Right? every chance you get. Um, just filter out the beetles and put your liquid back in. Mm, yeah. Okay, so it's filled with a liquid, and then that makes them kind of fall in in a way okay yep. interesting and boiling them gets the crispiness you don't have to like fry them or any oh that's any... right you have to dehydrate them i missed okay. that part so okay. after you make them taste like you want to mm -hmm. uh, after you boil them you filter you filtered out the water it's just the beetles roll them or or marinate them and whatever you know a little bit of liquid helps but not super necessary mm -hmm. um, and then you dehydrate them in a dehydrator if you don't have one of those you can uh, use your oven Perfect. Um, on the lowest heat setting with the door propped open. Just spread them out on a cookie sheet and it, it'll take something like six hours maybe. Mm -hmm. So it's a good wintertime activity. Yeah, um, perfect. Yeah, if you've like frozen your beetles till now. Um, <laughs> yeah. Saved all of them up. Like the whole freezer is just full of beetles. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, people have freezers full of deer and bison yeah. and that's All true. the other animals that from like in the forest, why not the beetles too? <laughs> Just a body freezer of <laughs> Japanese beetles. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, tasty. Pretty no, metal. I would have to try that. That sounds pretty delicious, to be honest. Um, that's cool. Is there something that you have been searching for, like foraging, and you haven't found yet? Ooh, you know what? So this year has been really good to me on the Ooh, bucket list front. Good. So I found, for instance, I found um, Pluteus americanus, mm -hmm. which is one of the native psychedelic mushrooms in Minnesota. Oh, and then, okay. yeah, I traveled. That's an oyster to, type. So, so not Pleurotus, but Pluteus. Oh, okay. So it's actually closest related to like Pluteus cervinus, which is the deer mushroom or the Got fawn it. mushroom. Sometimes people call it. Got it. Uh, but it's this really like, you know not very eye-catching um, mushroom that grows on logs mm -hmm. um, you know in the spring its relatives will come out like the deer mushroom but then this one starts kind of like late summer and goes through October interesting and uh, it lightly stains blue like but it's more like almost a gray mm. uh, it'll have pink gills like pink spores so the gills will start off white and then turn pink Wow. And unlike its relative from the spring, the deer mushroom, um, Pluteus americanus will not smell like radishes when you smell it. Okay. So yeah, it was really cool. I was like, I can't believe, it was a cool story about how I found it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I couldn't believe I found it. Yeah. And then um, 
uh, I found a ton of other stuff. So like I went down to Southern Illinois because, you know, Minnesota being so dry this year, I had to travel. Mm, so yeah. I went to Wyoming and Colorado for mushrooms and I went to Southern Illinois and Missouri for plants. Okay. And yeah, this year I found spice bush berries for the first time. Oh, they don't really? grow in Minnesota. Okay. So I was super excited about that. It's, awesome. it's a bright red berry that tastes like cardamom kind of with like okay. a little bit of ginger. Mm. Yeah, super amazing. I also oh. found wild pecans for the first time. Wow. Gosh, I also saw, list. Um, I know, I saw Marsh Elder. What, what is it? Marsh Elder. Marsh Elder. So it's like related to sunflowers, but it looks nothing like them. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and it was one of the domesticated crops. Well, arguably not domesticated because it's so good in its like wild form, mm -hmm. but it might've been, it was definitely cultivated okay. um, by the people that lived at Cahokia um, about 800 or so years ago. Wow. Um, and Cahokia was the largest city in North America, north of um, Mexico, okay. uh, until Philadelphia surpassed it in sometime in the 1800s. So it had about 40,000 people in it. Wow. Yeah. Cool. Okay. It was, yeah, it's one of the places that they first um, invented agriculture. So there's only 10 places on the planet that agriculture was independently invented. And this Ooh. is one of them. So I had to visit. It's a really important spot to me. Oh, that's really cool. Okay, so you were visiting like specific places to view either plants or like the culture this year? Yeah, inextricab awesome. inextricably linked uh, the plant culture and mm -hmm. the uh, native culture. Mm, awesome. Yeah. I like that. And then you bringing it back to Minnesota to educate people. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. <laughs> awesome. What does a typical day look like for you, Tim? Ooh, uh, I would say the typical day for me looks anything but typical. Perfect. I, you know, every day is different. So I think we if you that. don't want a day to be typical, this is a good career path mm -hmm. <laughs> to go into. Um, you know, it's a very self-starter type of career being a forager. So you're going to get exactly what you put into it. Um, That's a good point. So it's an intrinsically motivated person, the kind of the go-getter. Um, someone with a, you know, you don't always need to be charged up, but you need to be able to have this battery that mm -hmm. you can charge up. That's good so, advice. Yeah, I get up pretty early, get up at around 6 a.m. Mm -hmm. <laughs> getting uh, yelled at by these birds up here. Um, just one of the perks of being outside for exactly. an interview. Yes. Um, yeah, so I get up at about 6 a.m., but I will get up earlier um, mm -hmm. in certain times of year, like for sugar bush maple syrup making i'll get up you know four or five a.m uh because you got to get fires started and start gathering water from the trees all day um and then mushroom hunting you know sometimes you want to get up before the sun rises yep. so you can be the first person out there when the sun first rises over the horizon and mm -hmm. you can finally see <laughs> it's going to be you and a lot of um like elders from russia or from Ukraine mm -hmm. are gonna be all out there because they love hunting mushrooms too. That's awesome. Um, and you're all gonna pretend like that's not what you're out there for. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, and then you typically harvest until, you know, until you get tired, you know, maybe lunchtime or a little bit after. And then that's when it's time to sell to restaurants. Mm -hmm. So you do have to go in before their dinner service. So, you know, you do have to learn fine dining customs a little bit, like. Um, at least the restaurant and back of the house customs. Okay. So, you know, typically they open at five or four or five. And so you want to get there around two because okay. the, the prep books and stuff are already there. Yep. Um, yep. So you, you walk right in the back um, and provided that you're certified, of course, uh, by the Minnesota Department of Agriculture and the Minnesota Mycological Society to sell mushrooms. Mm -hmm. uh, that's when you're able to, you know, engage with really high level chefs and watch them just totally geek out about any mushrooms <laughs> <you're doing. laughs> yes i love that yeah, yeah. um That's and then cool. yeah it just depends whatever ingredients you are harvesting um you know there's a thoreau quote that kind of sums up my life and I, i'm gonna butcher it sadly i should <laughs> perfect probably, i should probably start trying to remember it <laughs> word for <laughs> word but it's something like um drink the drink and 
eat the food in each season as it passes and live with the natural rhythms of the earth. It's mm-hmm. something like that. You mm-hmm. put it way more beautifully, but there's a, a big wave of people that want to eat locally and seasonally. And it, it literally means you have to be a forager or yeah. know a forager. Right. Because when you have, when you have certain plants or mushrooms that are only out for, you know, maybe 10 days all year. Yes. That's as hyper local and hyper seasonal as it gets, Mm -hmm. as is everything you make with those. Mm -hmm. That's Mm -hmm. a good point. I like that. Yeah. Cause I um, used to work with Forest to Fork, if you've heard of them and they're in St. Paul. Um, So I was working with them. So that sounds kind of like the job that I had to do is, um, like go into behind the scenes of the restaurants and show show them some of the mushrooms that we had so that's that reminds me of those times it's awesome um, and they're always happy to see you right oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> um so, some are like oh who is this person but then they see some of the mushrooms and plants and they're like oh okay okay they're cool <laughs> yep, exactly. <laughs> and then they're always like oh you guys got the fun ones right yeah of course they're all fun (laughs) yeah they're all fun they're all good they're all they're all fun oh yes uh do you have advice for your younger self if you could go back oh gosh um (laughs) well I think my younger self if I could go back I would try to get involved with plants and mushrooms a lot sooner Mm -hmm. I, I wish that the feral little cockney pickpocket that me and my twin were um, I wish I could say, hey, that thing you're doing, like, you should start re- trying to read books about it. You should, um, you know, like, kind of do it on purpose rather mm-hmm. than just a crime of opportunity, <laughs> you know, like, yes, yes. Yeah, get out there and do it on purpose. And by the time you're old, like I am now, um, you could really be something. And mm-hmm. I think it would have, you know, given me a lot of direction in life, which is definitely something I needed. Uh, So if anybody's listening and you need, you know, if one direction is as good as any other for you, uh, I would suggest picking up a book about plants or picking up a book about mushrooms and then Mm -hmm. going on hikes and just do that with your time. Yeah, no, that's a, that's some great advice. I, oh, I feel like everybody I talk to wishes they got into what they got into sooner. Um, So that's, that's cool that people have that hobby or that passion in the beginning, and then they kind of fall off that wagon, but then they always find it again. That's kind of, I guess, what I went through too. So I didn't know going into college that I would be into plants or fungi, and then it just kind of happened. So I'm glad I'm here with you. What advice would you give yourself? Oh, that's a great question too. Hmm. I think I would want to work on more public speaking. Like I think the podcast is really helping me to either network with people, which I feel like I didn't know was such a big component of things is like who you know, um, as well as what you know. So networking, I think at a younger age, which is weird to say like who who trusts like a 12 year old or something. <laughs> so so it's um, that or just yeah, like working on speaking or just branching out and meeting more people, I think is what I would give my own advice for. Yeah, that's really good. Yeah, networking yeah. is so important. Yeah, so. Yeah, like but, I, I originally got into this because I wanted to be this hermit in the woods. <laughs> exactly. I was a little bit misanthropic. I was a little bit like, you know, in my early 20s, I was kind of like this kind of like hurt baby bird, you know, mm. by people and their expectations of me and whatnot. And so I did think nature was going to be this place that I retreated into and never came out and never had to see anybody ever again. Um, yes. And so I've had to relearn like, and maybe learn for the first time, like how important community is and yeah, networking, how yes. important that is too. So Yes, I totally agree. I was like, oh, I like studying plants because they don't talk back, but you have to talk to people about what you're learning to, for them to learn with you. So <laughs> that's true. Um, okay, a few, a few more questions. Um, I think we talked about some of the future plans, um, but what are some of your future wants with yourself or MMS or um, your own company? Yeah, I mean, let's say for the MMS, I 
would love for it to just keep growing and getting better every year. I mean, an organization that's existed for over 120 years yeah, uh, is obviously doing something right. And it was given a really strong initial push mm-hmm. by um, the founder, uh, Mary, Dr. Mary Whetstone. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, she was a 19th century polymath. I mean, she was abs- an absolute force. Um, I wish I could have met her. You know, she's probably one of the people I would love to meet if time machines become a thing. Um, <laughs> she founded a hospital, like in, coincidentally, the hospital I was born at, getting bit up by mosquitoes out here. Oh, I know, it's um, getting that time of night. Yeah, and so she, I guess, you know, I would hope that, yeah, they just grow and get better. And it's the members that create the organization because it's all volunteer driven. So mm-hmm. I would hope that it just looks more and more like the members want it to look. Yeah. As far as... um. Yeah, I guess as far as my company, I hope to write a book someday. Um, awesome. That would be nice. I think, I think I have like a unique perspective on it and that hasn't really been written about yet. And that's kind of the hard thing to nail down. So yeah. I would love that to happen. Um, I just hope to grow in my knowledge as well, um, travel more. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I'd love to, so having a degree in anthropology, you know, a focus on culture is very important to me too. So plants and mushrooms exist in a cultural sphere, both past, present, and future. So um, I do love to engage, you know, with language and and just anybody that has any sort of plant knowledge around the world, I just, I want to learn about it. Yeah. So I hope I can pursue that too. Um, and then I guess one last thing would be like, I hope I create a lot of foragers. I hope my legacy is that, you know, someday like thousands of people got into foraging because, you know, maybe I showed them something one time and then that becomes part of our culture. Mm -hmm. I guess it's my goal that in a hundred or 200 years that everyone just takes for granted the knowledge that, you know, I find so amazing now. I, Mm -hmm. I want everyone to know about these plants and mushrooms and have it be like, I almost hope that someday it's mundane. Yes. Yes. Like it's this common knowledge that everybody is on the same page as this. Yeah. I think it would make the world a lot better place. I think so too. And how can flora and fungi as a whole influence the future? Oh gosh. (laughs) That's a big question. Yeah, you know, I think they've, I think they've all, they always have. I mean, Mm -hmm. since they helped each, you know what? I think a good answer would be flora and fungi. You know, fungi helped flora rise out of the oceans and get onto land. Mm -hmm. Um, It's a little bit, you know, debatable how they actually did it, but it's my understanding that fungi acted as the vascular system for these, you know, for plantae to get onto land and, you know, helped them in their first steps. And I think the lesson there is that community and working together and Mm. bridging what seems like unbridgeable gaps is what's going to help all of us move into the future. Cause I'm not sure if we don't learn that lesson that there will be a future. So Flora and Funga, I think that's what they're teaching us. And I think we, we need to learn that. Yeah. We need to just take a listen. I love that. Yeah. Perfect. And how can more people get involved with flora and fungi? Seems like a similar question, but. I mean, get outside. Yeah. I mean, it sounds very simple, but, Mm -hmm. you know, getting outside, you know, I spent most of my life um, just going for walks or going for jogs or or playing in the woods without Mm -hmm. actually seeing what was around me. I knew that, I knew that green surrounded me. I knew that a tree was different than a flower. Um, But I never actually like looked closer. And it's so weird to me now, but I think before I got interested in uh, mushrooms, I'm not sure if I ever even saw a mushroom. But now I know that I had to have seen mushrooms all over the place. Right. They didn't exist to me, so I didn't see them. Yeah. Um, And I think that's the first step Mm -hmm. is get outside and see what is actually around you. Now, words of caution you know all mushrooms are safe to touch uh and smell so please do um Mm. you know all mushrooms are safe to pick both for you and them um they are fruit so 
they'll actually kind of enjoy you picking them and spreading their spores a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, plants, not so much though. Plants have delicate tissues that they need to protect that aren't, you know, underground or in a piece of wood. So maybe don't touch every plant, but definitely look at them real hard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> <No>. Yes, <laughs> that's some good advice. Awesome. Uh, and I know that you post a lot on your Instagram. So where can people find you and any resources that you suggest for listeners? Oh, yeah. So I would suggest, you know, first of all, where to find me. So at MN Forager, that's M N as in the, the abbreviation for Minnesota, yep. MN Forager, uh, www.ironwoodforaging.com. Mm -hmm. And then Ironwood Foraging on Facebook as well, even though Facebook is, you know, kind of a dead app, but um, whatever. <laughs> I'm on there. It's, a, it's a good networking thing where you can create events and stuff like that. So, yeah, exactly. Um, mm -hmm. And then some resources I suggest if you get one book after um, watching this would be Sam Thayer's Forager's Harvest. Oh, OK. Sam Thayer absolute renaissance man um one of the best foragers i know he's a friend of mine i don't get a kickback from this but <laughs> yeah he has books that i highly see all his books i highly suggest so please awesome. get those and then um if you're in the minneapolis or minnesota area or not and you just want to visit and take a class mm -hmm. um you should take a class with the person i first took a class with and that was Maria Westerly of fourseasonforaging.com. Okay. Um, she's incredibly knowledgeable. Um, the first class I took with her, I remember every second of it like it was yesterday. That was Aww. like a decade ago. And, uh, you know, her knowledge and her approach and um, she, she just changed my life, you know, That's and the awesome. plants that I learned from her just changed my life. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you for all of that. And thank you, Tim, for being on the podcast. This this was really nice, and I'm glad it all worked out. And I'm glad that you um, got this new nine to five job being a gardener. You said, "Yep, gardening." <laughs> nice. I that's that's my dream goal. I mean, I just love being outside anyway. So, um, is there anything else that I did not ask you, or anything else you'd like to mention? You know what? I'm a real talker. If anybody hasn't gotten that yet. Um, <laughs> I could talk forever. Yes. Uh, I guess we just have to see each other around again. Yes. And that's why I like interviewing you. You're fun to talk to and you didn't run out of stuff to say. So it's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know awesome. if I ever would. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's perfect. Perfect. All right. Well, I think that's all I have for tonight. So um, I'll let you get out of the, the dark that it's going to be. It's getting dark outside now. So right yeah okay thank you kk for having yeah. me thank you very much have a lovely night and week you too thanks